and everything in the same place. <laughs> but you have to um, listen fast. <laughs> so as uh, Bruce is giving the background, that's great. I can cut through some online, but um, this is a dual portion. And as you said, we talked about the mystery of the red number before. And uh, if you want, that's an online teaching that I can send you a link to. It, there was a mystery and we looked into that mystery and we saw the mystery is revealing Yeshua to us. And anytime when we are in scripture, the scriptures are revealing Yeshua to us. So this time we have a different type of a mystery. This is a mysterious prophet. He's called a prophet, and his name is Balaam. And our background is verse 2 of Numbers 22. Balaam, the son of Zephora, saw all that Israel had been to the Amorites. Now, who's Balak? And easily, it's, you confuse the names Balak and Balaam. So if you're like me, I always find some sort of hook to help me hold on to. So I've got an easy way. Balak ends with a K. He's the king. Balaam ends with an M. And you're going to see more reason than one madman <laughs> made it fits this way. So when you're trying to remember who's who, Balak K King, Balam Madman. <laughs> now, we're big strange bedfellows. Right. Israel's on her way to the promised land. The Moab King is the territory that she's coming into, and he does not know what Israel's intentions are, but he's heard. What happened to the Amorites? Yeah. He's heard that they were destroyed. So he's afraid. And what do you do when you're afraid? You start looking for how you can strengthen yourself. Who can you pull alongside? If I can't stand alone, who can I get with me? Now, the Moabites were the sentence of Lot in his incestuous relationship with one of his daughters. And they were always at enmity with the Midianites. But the king of, of Moab, Balak, went to the Midianites and said, let's make a united front. Let's stand against Israel. And probably thought with the two groups, he, they could do okay. But when they merged, they installed a new king. And that new king is Balak. His uh, former name is the Zur of Midian, if you go looking for him in your history. This king was a magician. He was trained in the occult. He was used to what I would call black magic, at least, at least magic. So he's not going to prepare for a conventional war. He's going to fight what he believes he could win, and that's a war in the spiritual powers. And he knew of this uh, renowned magician, also another one, by the name of Balaam. Sometimes you see Balaam, and sometimes you see Balaam, but they're one and the same. Because remember, our Hebrew markings are the only way we get vowels. But he knew that Balaam had powers, magical powers. He had magical powers. So again, he thinks them together, together we can defeat Israel. So Balaam, who is the son of Baor, not to confuse you, but to give you the background, he came from Aram. The area that he came from is where Avraham came from, Mesopotamia, Syria, that area. And he was considered one of Israel's greatest foes. I equate him, and so do other sources that I read with, Ron in the book of Esther. He is just no good news. I'm sorry, he's just not. And his name may mean not of the people. But there's also a view that says his name means madman. So when I told you I'm um, madman, I'm really giving you one of the definitions of what his name uh, possibly did mean, and if not that, definitely corrupter of the people. So if he's a madman, if he's not of the people, he's a corrupter of the people, you can see he's no good news. Now, our Jewish tradition, and it is tradition, it's not that we can give you scripture of that, but if it says that he was actually Laban, I call him Laban, this ground set. And if you don't know who Laban or Laban is, then you've got to think about Rachel. You've got to think about Jacob and, and Rachel and Leah. You've got to get into that time. You know how what his character is like and his grandson is just that much worse. If he is Baal or or Baal or which we think is speaking of the same one in our scriptures, and he also had a reputation of being a world semantic god. So the, the people's 
worship him because of his magical, magical, I should say, powers. But he was definitely regarded as a great seer. That's what they called prophets, S-E-E-R, great seer. He was a magician. He was adept in the cult. He had an evil eye. He was known. Um, powerful people would come to him and get him to invoke curses on their enemies. And he had a reputation that what he cursed would be cursed. Now, I'm sure I have absolutely just endeared belong to your heart. You just can't wait to meet him one day. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and since I've given you his finer points, you have to be thinking, well, if he's so bad, why do we want to pay any attention to him? Aren't there better characters in the Bible for us to spend our time on? Yeah. But let me tell you what scripture does with him. <laughs> It has a lot to say about him. It speaks about him 51 times in scripture. There's your number to my verse. <laughs> it speaks of him more than it does of Miriam, the mother of Yeshua. Right. It speaks of him more than 10 of the apostles put together. Yeah. He's mentioned three times in our Berlachat Shah, even though he is existing all the way back in, in uh, the time of Moshe. And even before we're finished with our original covenant, we come to our prophet Micah, and Micah, Micah is a good prophet, one that, that's unto the Lord. He tells us we're supposed to remember him. So I think, okay, then there's something to learn from this. Micah, chapter 6, verse 5 says, My people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, planned, and what Balaam, son of Aor, answered him. And what happened from Shatim to Gilgal, the area that they were in? And here's our key. So that you might know the righteous acts of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Or one version says you might know the saving deeds of Adonai. So even though we're going to look at someone evil, what we're to learn and what we're to see is the righteous acts of the Lord. So I say it's on. It's on. we got a battle and we know who's going to win. And... Uh, um, well, let me read to you real quickly the three times he's mentioned in the British Badashah in the New Covenant, and you'll see all three times they're dealing with one thing in common. I won't say it till I've read it, see if you pick it up. Second Kiva, Second Peter chapter 2, verse 15 says, abandoning the right way or the straight way, they've gone astray, having followed the way of Belong, the son of Baor, who loved the reward of unrighteousness. Little Book Viewed, Chapter 1, only one chapter, verse 11 in Ewan. Woe to them, for they've gone the way of kindly king, for the, and for pay, or for money, they've given themselves up to the error of the law, and perished, or were destroyed, and don't miss this, in the rebellion of Korah. Mm -hmm. now remember, we learned about the rebellion just last week, and God opened up the earth and swallowed them up when they were in the wrong. Revelation 2.14 is our last time he's mentioned, but here we are going from Bereshit to Revelation with this name being mentioned. But I have a few things against you because you have some there who hold the teaching of the law, who kept teaching the law to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. This verse in the end really spells out what's going on back here in Bereshit. But did you catch all three times? I can sum it in one word, apostasy. They fall away from what God's plan is. We've got belongs doctrine, we've got belongs way, and we've got belongs error. All three are down away from God and from his purpose. Now, some say, okay, then he couldn't have been a genuine prophet if he is is an error and it, his ways are of error and others say that god gave him the gift of prophecy so how can you say he's not god's prophet hmm. and i'll let you battle with that as we go on with our lesson for tonight but the bottom line when you talk about iraq i'm sorry belong you are being told warning warning learn from this don't follow this see the error, see where it's false, and begin to discern what you should be learning from it, because it's certainly not an example set before us for us to follow. 
So, uh, and by the way, I'll call this to give you a hint how I feel about him. I'll call my message tonight, prophet, P-R-O-P-H-E-T, for prophet, P-R-O-F-I-T, because that's where his heart was. <laughs> Back to our story. Israel's advancing toward the promised land. It's toward the end of the 40 years. They've entered new territory. They've gained a victory. The word has spread. So they've come now into the territory of Moab, of Malak, the king of Moab, afraid to engage in this battle. And he resorts to superstition. He engages a famous, quote, prophet of the day to come and curse Israel. That's what he asked him to do. If you curse them, then maybe I can get the victory. I can win. So you go curse it, and I'll do my part, and we'll have this great victory. And that's what we're told in verse 6 of chapter 22. You might want your Bible open in front of you. I'm not going to give you much time to read because I fight that clock. But read that chapter later before you lose tonight's message if you have any desire to really grasp hold of it. And here's where our enigma does come in. Because once again, we have a madman being called a prophet. And he is going to, out of his mouth, utter some great prophecies in regard to Israel. It's so, uh, amazing. He's going to speak about the star out of Jacob, out of Jacob. And it's on the basis of that prophecy, along with some other prophecies that they had, that our wise men come to Yerushalayim at the time of Yeshua's birth, or, or shortly thereafter, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Because they say, we've seen his star in the east. And they knew they wanted to come and they wanted to worship him. We'll talk more about that prophecy. That's in chapter 24 and verse 17 as we get through the message. But right now, Balak's going to hire uh, Balaam to curse. And he's uh, he tells them they're dangerous people. Now, Balak, is he choosing to step up to the plate because he is a genuine prophet of God and wants to speak for God? Or... Is he a religious racketeer? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you know what my answer is. <laughs> Balaam said he go and ask God what he could say, what he should say. And God told him that night, so God did speak to him, regardless of whether you believe he is a good prophet, a the, on, honestly trying to be a prophet, or whether he's in it for the, the money. But God told him, no, you're not to do this. No. Well, Balaam told Balak, God said no, and Balak was not going to take no for an answer, so he just ups the ante. Mm -hmm. And he takes some of his most important men. Actually, he sent his men. He didn't go with them, but he sent them back to him and basically told them, whatever he wants, tell him he can right. have it, right. you know, silver, gold, like Bruce said earlier, this is verses 16, 17, and verse 18. We have the answer in 18, actually, and here's Balaam speaking, and he says, even if, a, if Balaam were to give me his palace filled with silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of Adonai, my God, to do anything great or small. He's saying, I can only go as far as God lets me, but did you notice what he said? Even if Balak gave me a whole palace full of silver <laughs> and gold, do you know what he just did? He basically said, hey, Balak, you want me to do this? Here's my price. Right. He right. wasn't saying, you know, using just an expression. He was laying his price out. What do I want? I want a palace full of silver and gold. So, again, religious racketeer or prophet. I'll call him a prophet for profit. And he is even willing to go speak to God again. But God has said no. And see if he can get God to change his mind as long as the price is right. <laughs> Come on down. <laughs> the price is right. And it almost sounds in our story that God changes his mind. Because in verse 20, God tells him at this point, if he wants to go with them, he can go with them that he's only going to be able to say what God allows him to say. And what we really see in this is not a change of God's mind, but it's basically Balaam has been having an argument with God. And sometimes we will do this. 
but God, I really want this. And you know, we're so sure it's something good. And we just, they're really arguing. And even like a parent will finally do. Okay, if that's what you want, then I'll permit it. Right. But here's the boundary. And that's what God finally does. He says, I, I'll permit it. This is not really my will. This is not what I want. But I'll go ahead and I'll allow it. I'll permit it. And I think we need to be very, very careful when we're in that position with God. Because if God is saying no or wait or directing us in a different way, there is a reason for it. He is not uncaring and he's not doing it out of spite. That's not our God. But we read in Tehillim in Psalm 106, verses 14 and 15, that became lustfully greedy in the wilderness and put God to the test in the desert. Mm -hmm. So he gave them their request, but he sent a wasting disease among them. What's that telling us? When the children of Israel wanted their own way, when they had a heart that wasn't after God, that I want, they started having greedy thoughts and desires. God finally allows them to have it, but he sends a leanness into their souls. They're not growing in their walk with the Lord, and they're not going to come in a better place with the Lord. They're going to be satisfied with worldly things because God isn't going to just be their nagging. That's not who God is. But he's going to let you begin to find out, hey, that grass was not greener. It didn't taste better out there in the world. And I will warn you, if you are trying to get God on your side, <laughs> you might want to stop and think about, aren't I supposed to be on God's side? Because we can unbalance that very easily. Children of Israel in the wilderness, what he's talking about, they're being fed. They have everything they need to, to stay healthy. It would have been the perfect diet, Bruce. <laughs> it would have met every need. And what do they say? We want meat. Yeah. Right. We're tired of this stuff. <laughs> give us meat. Right. <laughs> God finally says, all right, I'll give you meat. I'll give you so much. It's going to come out of your nostrils. Right. Like Davis. <laughs> and that's what happened. But sometimes God has to work that way with us because we get stubborn, because we think we know better, because we have such a strong desire. And how can it not be good? And I think this is where the law stepped into it. When he went back to God and he's asking to do something, I think he probably was rationalizing. Well, you know, there, there's got to be a good reason for this. And he's trying to come up with his excuse or his reason or whatever. And here again is what we do. We will rationalize, well, it must be right. The only thing that pops in my mind is an extreme for our group here tonight, but you'll get my point. Have you ever been around someone who is about to marry? They are a believer, and they're about to marry an unbeliever. And our scriptures very clearly say, do not be unequally yoked. Yeah. And when you confront them with the word of God on that, yeah. almost without fail, oh, but God told me it's okay, because I'm going to reach my mate after we get married. Yeah. And I have seen a burn and, and crisis, and just, it's never ended good. I've never seen it once end good. But I think that's what we're doing here. We're rationalizing. We, we're going to figure a way to make it sound good and make it sound right. We're going to, you know, this is a good thing we're doing. So the has got his, I can go. So he's going to go and he saddles up his donkey, but he has no spiritual eyesight. Instead, he's got those dollar signs in his eyes. And really, in all honesty, his donkey had more spiritual insight than he did because the donkey sees the spiritual happening and, and he doesn't. Um, and, and again, I read to you from Second Peter where it says they've gone their own way. They've gone astray. And he was full of covetousness. This was what had gotten his desire to, to do what he was doing. And verse 16 of 2 Peter 2 says that. It says, but he, speaking of the law, he was rebuked for his iniquity. Now, in the version I read it in, it says, a dumb donkey. <laughs> I had to laugh because it really meant a mute donkey. Right. Yeah. But I still thought, yeah, even a dumb donkey had more sense than he did. Right. <laughs> so. <laughs> 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 I said it, I did. 
<laughs> but he said he was speaking with a man's voice, restrained the madness of a prophet. When it says that there, madness of the prophet, I think the madman is the best definition of his name. And why, again, you always remember Balak K. King and Balak M. Madman. So Balak takes him up to the mountain, he overlooks to curse Israel, and he can't. And this is even a known place of all worship, where they have all the power of all the faults of God, the, the satanic power that could possibly be there would be, you know, in that area. They were in, in Satan's camp, I'll put it that way. And Numbers 23 now, Bhavid Bar, chapter 23, verses 8 through 10, Balaam says, how am I to curse those whom God has not cursed? How am I to denounce those whom Adonai has not denounced? From the top of the rocks, I see them. From the hills, I behold them. Yes, a people that will dwell alone and not think of itself one of the nations. That was key. Israel was not mixing with the nations. She was separate. Why? Because the nations are heathen. The nations are idolatrous. The nations are worshiping the false gods. Israel was the only one that wasn't. And she had to stay separate. Because if she mixed in, just like I said about that one wanting to marry a mate that wasn't saved, almost without fail, it brings the saved one down and they go into the pit of the unsaved. Who has counted the dust of Yaakov or the number or numbered the ashes of Israel? And then Balaam even says, May I die as the righteous die. May my end be theirs. What he was saying is, even in their death, they're blessed by God. And so he's saying, I want to live that way. I want to do things my own way, but I want their end. <laughs> kind of like a, a Sunday school um, class. A teacher was teaching about the rich man and the last, the Lazarus, the beggar, the two that had died. And the rich man went into suffering and torment. And the beggar, who had just a, a horrible life, was the one who was being comforted now in Abraham's um, bosom. And the teacher asked the kids, honestly, in this life, which one would you rather be? The poor beggar or the rich man? And the class was very quiet. The kids really didn't want to answer, and they really had to wrestle with this. And finally, one little boy was brave, and he spoke up, and he said, well, he says, I want to be like the rich man. But I want to die like the beggar. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of what the law was doing. You know? We want that compromise. We want to have a cake and eat it too. But this is not where it was, you know, that's how it's allowed. But God is going to speak through the law because God's methods, God's ways are not going to be thwarted. Outwardly and inwardly, Israel was different. Outwardly, they were separate. Inwardly, they were worshiping the true God. And because of that, God had, well, not because of that. I have to eat those words. Apart from that, God had chosen them and said he would be faithful. Because even in the rebellion, we see his faithfulness. And we see that, yes, Israel got off track. Israel went into captivity. Israel goes into a time of suffering. We see even today she is not reaping all the blessings and the benefit of her God, nor does she have all the land God has promised her. But God is faithful, and he will bring her to that. And even in her rebellious state, God's hand is still on her. She's still richly blessed and highly favored by God. And if you question that, how does a little tiny spot stand against the armies that are wanting to devour her? It's because of her God, because he is richly blessing her and helping her in a way that shows his faithfulness. Now, Balak's not satisfied. He doesn't like the fact that Balaam isn't cursing. And he tries it again. He takes them to another place. They make sacrifices again to false gods. And then, then he says, now, curse them if you can. Now, we've got all the power. We've got the gods happy. We've made sacrifices. Curse them if you can. And that's where Bruce read it earlier to you, verses 19 and 20 in, in Bhavid Bar in Numbers uh, 23. God is not a man that he would lie, not the son of a man that he would change his mind. He has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make good? Behold, I've received a command to bless. When he has blessed, I can't reverse it. 
Well, it goes on to say that God does not observe the iniquity and the wickedness in them that is with them. And it says the shout of the king is among them. And I think here's Balak trying to be king. And here's the king of kings. And he just shouts. And the voice is heard and it carries out. Whom the Lord justifies, no one can condemn. God may need to judge his people. And he may use others at times. We know he used Babylon. And we know he used Assyria to carry off his people in captivity. But it's by God's doing. He does not do it because someone falsely comes against his people. Remember, Balak and Balaam are only coming against Israel because they're afraid Israel might swallow them up. They have no idea. And Israel was not after them. Israel was headed for the promised land. Mm -hmm. But they're bringing a false accusation against mm -hmm. Israel. And God did not listen, and God would not allow it to go that way. How encouraging would that be to us? Is there a false accuser in your life? Does he not go right to the throne, to the king of kings? And does he not say, look at her. Look at Michelle. Look at what she's doing. You should bring all your wrath down on her. And yet, there's one who steps in and intercedes and says, Abba. Father, mm. she's in me. Mm. That's been washed away. Mm. She's my precious child, and she's wearing a robe of righteousness. And I think, hallelujah. Thank hallelujah. you, God. Yes. Not that it gives me a right to sin, but I know that even when I stand accused, and it can be the greatest lawyer. We've got an attorney's <laughs> parents here in the room. It can be the greatest attorney, the greatest case, the strongest slam dunk, you know what you deserve. And yet, praise God. Mm -hmm. As he did for Israel here, he steps in and he says, you know, you can't curse this way. And her end is better than yours. She will be brought into my kingdom and she will be blessed. Hallelujah. What a God we have. What we can learn from the long who could not curse what God had once. Another example would be David. How can you say David is a man after God's own heart? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, but he was an adulterer and he was a murderer. Is that who you want? And God says, it's his heart. Mm -hmm. I know his heart. Now, did he get away with what he did? Mm -hmm. No, he, he suffered greatly. There were consequences all his life for what he did. And beyond. And beyond. <laughs> Down to this day. <laughs> and sometimes our sins do visit the generations following us. But Romans 8, 31 to 33 says, What then are we to say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare even his own son, but gave him up on behalf of us all, is it possible, having given us his son, he would not give us everything else too. Mm -hmm. Allah, y'all want silver and gold? <laughs> I've got something even more priceless, greater than that. So who will bring a charge against God's chosen people? Certainly not God. He's the one who causes them to be considered <laughs> righteous. And that is the only way I'm considered righteous, is in his shed blood and wearing his robe. Hallelujah. Verse 34 of that same chapter, Romans 8, says that the risen Yeshua is at the right hand of God. And what's he doing there? Interceding for us. Mm -hmm. Interceding for us. Mm -hmm. The heir of the law, he didn't know any of this. All he saw was world and, and earthly possessions and desires. The law is finally going to express that he realizes Balaam is not going to curse them. And I get a kick out of him. Well, then at least don't bless them. <laughs> <laughs> but God on their side, it's not even neutral. They get blessed when this one tried to come against them. And then, he, then when Balak was so upset at Balaam, he turns to me and says, didn't I warn you? I must do everything Adonai says. And how encouraging to me to see, once again, even as we saw in Abraham's life, when he made mistakes and a heathen king 
pulled him up short. Why didn't you tell me the truth? Even when we make our mistakes, God is protecting us. God is with us, and that what a blessing that is. Unworthy, undeserved. Mm -hmm. I just fall on my face and thank him for his mercy. Well, Balaam and Balak are going to go on and do something even worse. I'll touch on that in just a moment. But uh, three times failed, three times no curse and only blessing. And uh, and yet Balaam, at this point now, is going to speak that prophecy that I referred to. And it's amazing because it is so opposite of what he had set out to do and what Balak wanted. This is not the doctrine of Satan. This is nothing demonic. But God had a plan, and it was thwarted, and God kept that plan. Let me tell you first, and then I'll come to that, that great prophecy, and I'll sum it up with that because it's time to end. But what Balak and Balaam do, Balaam's the one leading it, that's even worse. I see it all the way back to the garden. What did Satan do in the garden? In subtlety, he deceived. Right. And Balak, I'm sorry, Balaam says to Balak, okay, I can't curse them. I can't bring on them what you want, but I can tell you how to get to it. And he tells them, send in the Moabite women. Mm -hmm. Entice them. Mm -hmm. Let them mix in, because that will be their downfall. And it did. It led Israel into idolatry mm -hmm. and into spiritual immorality. Mm -hmm. And equally yoked, mixing with the world, and Israel gets herself in a lot of trouble. Um, yeah, in fact, Numbers 31, 16. Why these are the ones who, because of the laws of advice, cause the people of Israel to rebel, breaking faith with Adonai in the war incident, so the plague broke out among Adonai's community. And that's what Bruce referred to, the plague where 24,000 lost their lives before the, a stop was put to this. Any time we compromise with the world, mm -hmm. we're taking ourselves into a, an area that only the Lord knows how far down mm -hmm. and how deep the consequences and the suffering will be. Even when Satan comes against the called out ones, the chosen ones, it can't hurt them. And if we realize that and if we stand strong with the Lord on our side, what happens to the church when it's persecuted? It grows. It grows by leaps and bounds. It gets stronger. And we see what Satan does Okay, I can't get them from the outside. I can't get them from Balaam cursing them. Let me work my way in. Let me get on the inside. Mm -hmm. Anytime we allow anything in that is less than, we're going to pay the price of compromise. I believe this, these are the lessons we're to be learning. And why are we warned so greatly to listen to Balaam? And why do we find him in Bereshit and in Revelation? Because as I said, it started in the garden. And we all, no matter what generation, no matter where we are, this is where we have our battles. We fight not mixing with the world. We fight staying pure. We fight standing for the Lord when it's not popular or when something does look enticing. When we think that that pastor over there looks so much better than when I have. I don't want mom, but I want meat. <laughs> <laughs> we need to check our motives. We need to check our hearts. What is our motivation? God forbid any of us have a motivation of profit rather than to be a prophet because <laughs> we all are prophets when we're foretelling, foretelling the word of God. This is what we can do. And each time it got worse. He failed to curse at first. He blessed Israel. He, um, and then Balak um, was so mad. He, he, I'm sorry, I've got, I'm, I'm trying to hurry to finish it. What I'm trying to say is Balak, it got worse with him toward Balak. And he finally tells Balak, I'm not even going to pay you. 
you were supposed to get honored for what you did, but you didn't do it, so you don't get the honor. He walks away with a long time not to be. He failed. He failed the curse. He lost his reward. He's ready to go home. But without the long knowing, he saved the best <laughs> for last. Because this is where, when it's all done and all over with, and he's not getting any pay, he's not doing it for the lock's sake, this is where he opens his mouth. And he gives chapter 24, verse 17. I see him, but not now. Mm -hmm. I look at him, but not near. A star shall appear from Yaakov, from Jacob. A scepter shall rise from Israel and shall smash the forehead or the crush the corners, depending on your version, of Moab and overcome all the sons of Shep. Obviously, if he's saying, I see him, <laughs> but not now. Well, Balaam was on top of that hill looking down. He was seeing Israel. So this is how we know this was prophetic speech. He is referring to one that he couldn't see, one who wasn't going to come real soon, but this one was going to appear from Jacob. This one would be a star, glorious, and would have a scepter, power, and authority. This one coming out of Yaakov, and in the Hebrew tense, the way it is put, means certainty of an event predicted. I know it's going to be warm here tomorrow in the desert. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's the tense that was put in. Even though this one hadn't come, it is so sure it's as if it's done. And we know who it's referring to. The star that rises, the star that the, the, the wise men followed, we know that it is speaking of our Messiah. And in fact, Maimonides admits, he thinks it talks about two Messiahs in here. And he says, it's David, and then it's the Messiah. And then it's David, and then it's the Messiah. And it goes back and forth. I don't have time to tell you all of that. But it's several, and in our Dead Sea Scrolls, they do refer to this as Messiah to the point that our Bar Kokhba revolt in 132 AD, he was named son of the star because they thought he was Messiah. Like Schneerman. That's how he got his name. Like Schneerman. Schneerson? Schneerson. Yeah. yeah, like Schneerson. Yes, yes. Well, Moab goes down in defeat. We know that Moab never is able to conquer Israel. God had promised in Bereshit, in Genesis 49, 10, the scepter would not depart from Judah till the one had come, till Shiloh had come. And we know, again, it's a, a name for the Messiah. What we see is Messiah is faithful. What he says, he does. Mm -hmm. He will rule over the nations from Israel. How did Balak feel when he's hearing that? I have no idea. All I can tell you is they were conquered, they were captured, they eventually disappear. We don't have Moabites today, do we? No. I have no idea. They go down in total defeat at the hands of the future king of Israel who knows the way to reverse the curse. <laughs> That's what he did for the glory of God, mm -hmm. for Israel's glory. Final triumph, star, shepherd, what more can I say? Even for us, if we would take our spiritual battles to the Lord, what victory would we have? Because the Lord God of Israel will never forsake his people. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob, as he says in Isaiah 59, verse 20. He'll restore national Israel. He'll come back as king of kings. He'll complete what he has promised. And I promise you, Stay faithful to him, and you will see the faithfulness in your life now also. Mm -hmm. What we can learn from a prophet for profit. You know, it's, it's difficult that we, you know, we just kind of, I have to say, we sit here and we get the best of the best. We get the best music, we get the best teaching, the best of the best, and we just kind of sit here. Well, oh yeah, we're just writing this. <laughs> you know, 
But you know how difficult it is to condense that whole, all the teachings that are involved in Balaam and Balak. It's epic. And I will tell you, there's hours to see a mind that is But I'm the one blessed because I get so excited about what God showed me. And I'm thankful I have people who want to hear it, so I get to share it with them. So thank you. And, you know, as a, I know growing up as a Jew, um, we were told to be to separate ourselves from all the others, yes. you know, all the Gentiles. And we have to, and I really think that's where it comes yes. from. Right yes. there. I agree. Yeah, I agree. way back there. Keep yourself, you know, separate mm -hmm. from all the rest mm -hmm. of the nation. And that's because they all were in idolatry. They well, not just idolatry, but you know, God gave us a diet plan to follow. You eat these things and you'll be healthy. You don't you eat you don't eat those things and you'll be okay. He you know, from the beginning he said do these things and you'll live. You do these other things, you'll die. So, none of these diseases. None of these diseases, exactly. But I want you to appreciate how much we receive that you know it, it, that we just take for granted that we get the best praise and worship and the best teaching and sometimes we need to say thank you in our prayers and in life we need to say thank you Savior. thank you Thomas you are always feeding us our souls with praise and worship Thank you, Rochelle, for always bringing so much knowledge. <laughs> 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 well, went on to say, Oh, you have to have a cake. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. So, I, I, I'm going to say, Give you the ironic benediction, I guess, and then, and we get the best of that too. Yes. Yes. And ask you again, how many are going to be here next week? Because you know we've never gone this long, never. Several people never. said that, like three or four people told me they'd be here tonight, but didn't know. Yes, I know. I know. It's you know. In the summer, it's difficult because it's hot and we don't want to go out and we want to stay home. And then in season, oh, it's too difficult because I have so much to do. I either have nothing to do when I can't come or I have too much to do when I can't come. So, priorities. Priorities. Yeah. So, I hope you'll join us this summer. And Thomas has come up with this clever, clever. Um, name for this summer, which is Shabbat Nights. Summer, summer Shabbat Nights. Oh, I yes. Yeah. So when more, we, more to come on that. Yes, more to come. Read so, your emails. Oh, I didn't get it the last two. <laughs> okay, okay. We'll, we'll make sure you get it. I Um, shalom, shalom, shalom.